So, you know, when you think about it, and I was thinking about it for years, if you radiate, if, if you look at the universe, you find that everything in the universe radiates. What does it radiate in? In the vacuum. The vacuum of space. Well then, the vacuum cannot be thought of as empty, can it? Because no energy is lost, no energy is gained. So if all the suns, all the stars, all the galaxies, all the black holes, everything we see radiates into the vacuum, then the vacuum must be full. full of energy and it was clear to me that then the vacuum must be the contractive side of the event horizon the contractive side of the structure of reality the part we don't see why because it's contracting towards infinity puzzled about that and I remembered my first class of physics so again you know I'm all excited now I'm about 16 and I'm going to my first class of physics well, actually I'm like 14 or you know 15 something like that and I'm like oh my god today I'm gonna go into my first class of physics I'm gonna learn everything there is to know about atoms and reality so when I sat the first thing I did is put my hand up and you know the teacher didn't know me better at the time so he asked me what I wanted <laughs> and uh, I said what is an atom <laughs> I was surprised to hear the response. I thought, oh, he's just going to spell it out. What the heck is an atom? And he said, oh, that's way too complex for a first physics lesson. And in fact, we are not quite sure what an atom is. And I was like, huh? You mean that in all of the years of physics that have been going on on this planet you guys still don't know what the heck is an atom? how can you tell what anything else is then? right? and so I was like puzzled but one thing he said is that one thing we know is that the atom is made out of 99 uh, 0.9 Nine, 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 everything you see, everything you touch, everything is mostly space. nine, 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 so I start to think, maybe it's the exact contrary. Maybe the atom is just a result of a division in space. Aha! Like the fractal structure we just saw. Divisions of space to infinity. Now it starts to look a little different, doesn't it? Is your brain starting to hurt? that's okay if it does so space reality could be just various resolution right various divisions of space in a fractal structured vacuum there is two infinities in physics that sounds like a misnomer but that's the way it is one infinity is infinitely small quantities you know you mix this quantity with this quantity and you approximate it and you know infinitely small at one point you say okay well it doesn't matter it's just 
just bits, you know, like infinitely small. It's okay, you can ignore infinitely small. And then there is another infinity. That one has a highly technical term that is found in physics books. And that term is nasty infinity. <laughs> There's a thing in physics is that if you find nasty infinity, you got to somehow get rid of it. <laughs> and uh, if you don't, then your theory is no good. It's discarded. And, it, and the way they came up with a way to get rid of it is that they use a renormalization process. Basically, they take the infinitely large number and they cut it. So wh how did they renormalize this? Well, they took a thing that's called a Planck's distance. And I'm not going to go into too much details on how they derived this number. But it has to do with, with the Swerding, Swerdinger's equations. And the Planck distance is 1.616 multiplied by 10 to the minus 33. This is a small, small, <laughs> small little dot. And basically they say this little dot is the smallest thing the universe does. Right? We'll make the dot. See? Here's my Planck's link. And they say the universe goes to that small and then stops. It's like, I'm done. I'm out of here. This is way small enough. I ain't doing nothing smaller. Let's go with this. The universe is expanding. The vacuum is contracting to infinity. And all of reality emerged from the feedback between expansion and contraction. I want to talk about Nassim Harriman's recent paper on the Schwarzschild proton, which was not only accepted, but chosen by a panel of 11 peer reviewers at the University of Liege in Belgium to win the prestigious Best Paper Award in the field of physics, quantum mechanics, relativity, field theory, and gravitation. You know, if you have children, if they go to school, they're all going to get told that the solar system looks something like this. Planets go around like this in an elliptical course. Well, that is absolutely incorrect. The thinking of the solar system in this matter is equivalent to thinking that the Earth is flat. In fact, the Sun is moving through space and the planets are flying around the Sun generating this huge vortices as it follows the equator of the Sun. That is a completely different picture. All right, it goes from flat to spacious, to movement through space. And that makes a big difference. All of a sudden, you start to see that even planetary motion, solar motions around the galaxy, galactic motion, supercluster motion, and so on, all have this elliptical, vortecular dynamics of space. They all have this torque dynamic through space. Let's go back to the analogy of Einstein's field equation of the trampoline, trampoline curving to generate gravity. So basically Einstein said, gravity is the result of space-time curving like the surface of a trampoline. And basically what I say, what we say in this paper, is that yes, and when space-time curve, it doesn't just curve, but it curls, just like water going down the drain, and that generates spin, angular momentum. And that's the source of the spin of all things. So when we 
add torque to space-time, the solution gives us a very different picture than a perfect sphere. It generates a torus structure, okay, which is a sphere with two holes in the middle at the north and south pole. The result is a double torus structure, a double torus manifold that has this dynamic uh, which is uh, viewed here from above uh, as uh, a rotating uh, yin-yang sign, if you'd like. This significant paper marks a new paradigm in the world of quantum theory as it describes the nuclei of an atom as a mini black hole where protons are attracted to each other by gravitation rather than some mysterious undefined strong force. This radical new view of the quantum world produces a unification of the forces and appropriately pricks measured values for the nucleons of atoms. It begins with the quantum vacuum density, which is a measured 5.16 times 10 to the 93rd grams per cubic centimeter. Then we calculate how much vacuum energy would exist inside of a proton, which has a radius of 1.32 femtometers, multiplied by 4 thirds pi r cubed to get the volume. A density is mass per unit volume, so if you multiply a density by a volume, the Vs cancel to give the amount of mass that would be contained within a proton volume, which is 4.98 times 10 to the 55th grams which also happens to be the mass of the entire universe, existing inside each and every proton. The Sim also believes that this is evidence of an ultimate entanglement of all protons, which he mentions briefly in his paper. Just think of every single proton inside every single atom in your body connected through the vacuum to every other proton in the universe. We then calculate what proportion of the total vacuum energy density available in a proton volume is necessary for the nucleon to obey the Schwarzschild condition for a black hole. Where the radius of our black hole is now 1.32 femtometers, the radius of a proton, and we solve for m. The mass needed to obey the Schwarzschild condition for a proton radius of 1.32 femtometers is 8.85 times 10 to the 14th grams. Harriman then uses this mass to calculate the gravitational force between two contiguous Schwarzschild protons using the semi-classical approach. We yield a gravitational force of 7.49 times 10 to the 47th dynes. If we then calculate the relativistic velocity of two Schwarzschild protons orbiting each other with their centers separated by one proton diameter, we get 2.99 times 10 to the 10th, which is also equal to the speed of light. This essentially means that the protons inside of a nucleus can be thought of as black holes orbiting each other at the speed of light. A fascinating concept. If we then calculate the period of rotation of this system, we get 5.55 times 10 to the negative 23 seconds, which also happens to be the characteristic interaction time of the strong nuclear force. So apparently the strong force is actually quantum gravity at work due to the black hole nature of the Schwarzschild proton. Now it turns out if we plot every object in the known universe onto a logarithmic scale of mass versus radius, we find an approximate linear progression. Oddly enough, the Schwarzschild proton sits almost exactly on this line, while the standard model proton sits far outside, suggesting that the standard model is incorrect after all. I also liked how Nassim showed how one can obtain similar results by using the proton volume to Planck volume ratio multiplied by the Planck mass to get the same result of 4.98 times 10 to the 55th grams, the entire mass of the universe inside every single atom. This is important because the Planck length relates directly to the Fibonacci number and phi golden ratio, which is a key mathematical element in all self-replicating systems. The question is, what is replicating itself and why?